Hello and a warm welcome to today's Terminal Conflict livestream. Um, and what a glorious uh, Thursday it is. Um, August has finally arrived and as uh, the weather is moving towards autumn, uh, we are also uh, doing some fantastic things, everyone coming back from vacation. So, um, as you might have noticed, there is a small update uh, for the game today. Um, and you should be on version 978. Um, with this uh, update, there have been some fixes, amongst others, to mismanagement. Um, in particular, finance mismanagement and elite mismanagement. More details on this uh, later. But um, let me take you through one of the most requested elements that we've had in terms of the game. And we've been uh, asked by many if there was a um, way that we can make a video about for those who have just gotten the game and started how they should think when they start off the game. Um, another reason why we're doing this is we wanted to celebrate the fact that we now have 1,500 active community members on the Steam forums. And um, uh, so we thought, well, hell, let's, let's get into it. Let's show you guys, well, how and what you can do when you start up a brand new game of Terminal Conflict and explain a little bit about what you should be doing. So, to begin with, initially when you start, you meet up m with Mervyn, he tells you a little bit of things, and then you get to this main, to this menu, and you're told to begin either uh, here with land combat missions, uh, and then you can play through with sea combat, air combat, leader combat, and so forth, all the way up to the big picture. Now. Obviously, um, the big picture uh, in of itself is the first grand campaign. Uh, while the, whilst these four missions tell you a little bit about how combat works, because uh, it's something you, you should know about, the main game is not necessarily about combat. And um, of course, we'll explore that going into the grand campaign. Hey there, Lightning Lord. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to be looking at the big picture today and going through that a little bit. Um, so let's initiate. So starting off, you get to the welcome screen and um, yeah, it tells you that you are actually playing the United States president. Um, well, that's pretty much what you're doing. You are um, you have access to uh, everything that a US president would have in terms of uh, through this terminal. Um, and yeah, this terminal was created by Professor uh, Randall Garrison. So you just select OK. And it tells you about victory conditions. And as you see, the game has three main victory conditions. You, you need to gain 100 more VP than your opponent. So not just 100, but 100 more than your opponent. And you will see that up here in the top right corner. There's where you will, where VP is showed. Um, in case you go to a nuclear apocalypse, this condition must be still attained for victory. Um, and, uh, and that matters because you can actually get a mutual victory by just surviving, which is the next goal here. If you both survive, both the US and the Soviets survive until the end of the 1991 timeline, then you get a mutual minor victory. Uh, but this requires that no nuclear apocalypse is actually played out because then one of you probably will not survive. So, um, and launching a nuclear apocalypse where none of you get 100 more VP than, than your opponent means a mutual loss, actually. Mutual defeat for both of you. 
Um, now a third way to com to win is to complete the space race, and the one that completes the space race first actually wins because then you get an SDI defense and it neutralizes the threat of enemy nuclear attacks. Um, so those are the three main win winning conditions in the game. This of course also leads to um, yeah, this of course also leads to um, that kind of deadly race of who gets ahead, um, sort of the threat of mutual assured destruction. Hey, thanks for the follow, Four Gathers. All right, so before we get, can get to that, uh, let's go through this mandatory assessment. Um, basically, it. Uh, tells you to just click the OK button and we know that we can do that. Pretty easy. Now another thing is when we get decisions like, like this one, usually there are three, up to three options. You can just hover over the um, different options and we'll get a little bit of text. So let's examine these really quick. First option. Um, now these can give you clues of what to fulfill, or um, these can be conditions or things directed towards a particular option. And as we see here, yeah, to figure out which one we need to pick, uh, option one, it really clearly states, Mervyn tells us, do not pick this option. Um, option two, uh, this option is a trick by Professor Garrison. Option can end the turn when selected and exactly what an enemy might Okay, so option two is out of the question, and then obviously we need to pick option three. So this is just to show you the, um, the hover over function that decisions have. So yeah, let's select. Well, if you three. need me, just give me a tap. I'm always ready to serve. And now Mervin tells us that there's an, an encyclopedia where um, you can reach him up, up for top. Um, yeah, and we saw nuclear weapons uh, is a thing. Obviously, Second World War ended, nuclear weapons have been introduced. Uh, we also get a little bit of uh, insight here about Professor Garrison. Uh, apparently, he left us a message. Howdy, stranger. If things have gone south, you're reading this and Mervyn has survived. Um, obviously, Mervyn is the AI that, we, that talks to us now and then. We have uh, talked long enough in this country about nuclear weapons. It's time to write the next chapter in the Book of International Law and eliminate every trace of this evil. Okay, so by 1984, it seems that Professor Garrison that created the system uh, pretty much was kind of realizing the danger of it. My lord, for that terrible moment and what comes after, I reckon to envy the dead already. The hard part is, now it's all up to you. Enact policies and reconnect any missing departments. Find a way before it's too late. Goodbye and good luck. Hey, thank you, Professor Garrison. So he's telling us we need to find a way to basically not die, not destroy the world, not kill everyone. Pretty solid. So policies. Um, yep, that's this is where we'll find our policies that we need to reconnect and um, uh, the policies button for the US is is the star and then the hammer and sickle for the Soviets. And here we see the Mervyn button, the encyclopedia button we mentioned before. We also see we have seven turns uh, this timeline and we start here in uh, Western Europe. But let's check out the policies. So policies, there are goals um, and um, yeah, they can give you different benefits and usually what you want to do is you want to you want to look to set up um, focuses when you select them uh, decisions when you select them so in order that you can fulfill different policies because policies are awesome they give you awesome stuff um, yeah you can review them by hovering over them or you can even press and hold for two seconds uh, for those who have difficulty hovering um, and then you can, we can select to enact them. 
So for example here we have reconnect the Department of Defense. We can hover over it. It's available under any circumstance. Let's click on it and then we get the enact button to enact it. And what this does, it, it reconnects us to the Department of Defense or it reconnects our system to the Department of Defense. So realign Mervin missions and protocols. As long as the condition for it are fulfilled, policies may be enacted and they can lock or unlock other policies, provide bonus, resources, and victory points. Brilliant. And so let's do that. Let's enact it. Hey. Touch emergency protocol. Uh, yep, we reconnected to the Department of Defense. Resolve the Cold War. Okay. So, it seems as we reconnected, um, we also enabled the Doomsday Clock. So the Doomsday Clock will be up top here, as we see um, right about here. It will be visible on top of the screen, as mentioned, and um, it tells us how close we are to, to Doomsday. So the countdown to Doomsday, basically. The, the more it's lit up, the closer we are to Doomsday. Um, and when we, when it's fully lit, we can launch a nuclear apocalypse, or the opponent can launch a nuclear apocalypse. And this is something to keep in mind when we build strategies, because if we bring the Doomsday Clock up to max, it will actually, in many, during our turn, in many uh, instances, it means that the opponent will be the first to decide if they want to launch or not on their turn. Okay, so um, we've enacted and we've reconnected one and we see we've gotten new policies as well. Uh, the Marshall Plan. To see here, here we see what we need to fulfill in order to enable the Marshall Plan and we fulfill all of them. Doomsday at least three, we see here. Doomsday is three. And finance at least seven. We'll, we'll get to what, what finance is and what the, um, the different interests are. But uh, what does Marshall Plan do? Well, you can spend finance and people and government to gain eight influence in Western Europe, restricted to regions without Soviet presence. Okay, so let's explain a little bit about what presence is. So presence is where there is one or two influence on the map, either on our side or on the opposing side. So for example here, West German Alpine Zone, we have presence there, US presence. Um, where it's zero, it's actually a non-aligned region. So none of us have presence here because it has zero influence. Now, if we have more than one or two, then it's no longer presence, we actually get, have control. Like for example, the Soviets have control here in Yugoslavia, and it tells us that that's the case, just as we have control in Southern United Kingdom and Northern United Kingdom. Now, presence uh, uh, and control are, are, um, are different because in a region, and we see that they're colored a little bit differently. In in a region that only has presence, we we will not, we don't have enough influence to actually wage war there. Or our generals, in, the, in general, we will not feel our nation will not feel that it's worth while to wage war over an element. We can still attack there. So, for example, we can attack get attacked here in the West German Alpine Zone, but the. The difference is we can withdraw from this. We will not defend this region uh, as wholeheartedly as we would otherwise uh, defend a controlled one uh, like we have here. And if you do get attacked in the controlled region, there will be a war zone. Um, and a war zone, that's the striped region that we see, for example, here in Greece. There is a war zone here. And the difference between non-war zone regions like these ones and war zone region like this one is that any unit defeated in a war zone is immediately lost. 
whilst any de unit defeated in a non-war zone can withdraw. So that's a huge benefit. Um, okay, so let's do the Marshall Plan. Because it, it will, since we have it available and can do it, uh, it, will, it can give us some uh, much needed influence in Europe. So let's make that happen. So we enact that. Oh, and we get uh, General Curtis LeMay from the Strategic Air Command telling us something. Well, we need to consider the or order when enacting policies to maximize U.S. gain and maintain superiority in influence and military reach. Basically, it tells us we have three choices. We can give in to the communists. We'll never do that, of course. And he, he even says it's intolerable for him as well. Uh, number two, all out conventional war. Uh, that basically means using our units but doing non-nuclear attacks. Um, yeah, and build our strength to such a point that the USSR would not dare to attack us. Yeah, pretty much that's historically what we went with. As a nation, you balance five interests. Finance, the people, elites, military, and government. Ever tried getting your wealthy stingy uncle, your caring pacifist aunt, and your gun enthusiast cousin to agree on a shopping list? Indulge too much in one's interest, and the others will be left steaming. Hey, and there we go. That was Mervyn explaining uh, what we were talking about before, that there were different domestic interests in the game. So, if what we see in the map here is our external uh, politics, our foreign policy, what we see down here is actually our um, domestic politics. Uh, so, what does that mean? Well, uh, we have five different types of interests in our country. In, uh, and they, reign, they are finance, which is this, this first one here, people, the second one here, the third one being elites, military, and finally government. So what do we need to do? Well, as we see, these, are, um, these, these bars indicate how much influence uh, these different stakeholders have in our country. If we max out any of these, then uh, we give them a lot of influence in the country domestically. And what will happen then is they will start, basically, take power. Uh, adversely, if we uh, deplete it completely, to down to zero, then they will become very unhappy. So then they will start revolting against us, basically. Um, so we need to keep these balanced and like like indicated by these two arrows that's sort of the middle ground and we need to sort of keep it there what's also interesting is beneath each bar there's a number now these are zero so uh whilst these ones are both plus one that's our alignment and at, at the beginning of each timeline we will get whatever the alignment is for each and every interest in our nation. So if we go back and we look at when we started, we can, uh, what we can actually see is uh, that um, when we started the, um, uh, when, when we start initially every, every, uh, in every timeline, we will, we will then receive um, that amount uh, from our alignment. Now, in this grand campaign, we actually start with, uh, with some uh, funny elements. We can see the, entire, the entirety of the storyline of what has happened since 1954 when the system was established. Um, and how Mervyn has been created. Um, and what that also means for us in the long run is that um, yeah we can follow Mervyn's storyline whilst at the same time playing out the Cold War so 
to access the message log to check these kind of things, you can just click the text or the field just down here at any point. Just, yeah, that accesses the message log. Even if there's no text there, you can basically click underneath here. Um, and what that means is we need to consider now how much uh, alignment we gain going forward. So if this timeline ends, uh, then we will gain one finance and one people. Um, so we should probably not have eight in both of these, because if we do, then we will actually max these out. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and what this influence, uh, sorry, th these interests can be used for is to pay for everything else in the game. So if we, for example, look at units, we'll get to the command reserve later. And we'll look at constructing a unit, so unit procurement. Then we can see that, for example, to build a, an army command, it requires for finance. So we're building conventional units, which of course the the finance people in our nation, they will not like that we are spending it on military expenses instead of other things. Um, so that's why it will cost us finance to do so. But it can be a good thing to decrease finance so that they don't get too much say in our domestic politics. Okay, so let's look at what other policies we have available. Well, we have funding of NATO. What does this do? Well, it sets all USA controlled, remember three or four, regions in Western Europe to USA dominated. And dominated is when you have five influence. So any region that has five, not in Western Europe, but um, if we go to North America, and you can maneuver around on, on the map by clicking uh, these names. They are sort of uh, quick ways of getting around on the map. So if we click here, we get to Eastern Europe. Uh, if we click Western Europe again, we come back. We can go to North America by clicking that one. And so on. So for example, if we go back to our our home theater, um, then we see that here we actually have domination in these regions, five. Whilst these ones we have control in Western Canada, for example, you're in Eastern Canada and so on. So, presence one and two, control three and four, five is domination, and zero was uh, non-aligned. Now we can see that we act by, by doing the Marshall Plan, we actually gain some influence, like for example here in the Swedish Finnish zone, you can see that in Ireland. So we've done pretty well, pretty well. So is it a good idea to found NATO? Well, not yet, because it might be worthwhile to gain more, dom uh, more controlled regions, because then when we when we, when we enact this one, we can get more of them to become dominated. And that means increasing our regional influence, like I mentioned, to control, it means that we can get more into domination. Um, so this is about units and issuing combat orders, and we'll get to that uh, shortly. But I wanted to introduce how can we use units to increase influence on the map. Well, only one unit can actually increase uh, out of your military units influence on the map, and that is the army command. So if we select the seventh army here, for example, you can see that it can maneuver. We'll, we'll get to that another time. And it can maneuver across theater borders as well, and we'll get to that as well. But it has a, an ability called secure, and what that does is it ends your turn, but increases influence by two in a local region. So in this case, it would be West German Alpine Zone. Now we could move it somewhere else, 
Uh, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna we're gonna secure as much as possible of um, as much territory as possible, so we can do NATO. So let's go ahead and do that. So we get a short introduction to the turn timer. Because of course, uh, this is a turn-based game, so it means that the way it works is you take a turn, then the opponent takes a turn. Um, there's a mode where you can play with a turn timer, so... Uh, but in the Grand Campaign, there is no turn timer. And we see by using up a turn, we go from 7 turns to only having 6 turns left. And we also see that the Soviets have moved in a surface fleet into our um, West German zone here. Uh, we don't really like that, but... Um, we'll, we'll try to figure that out. Now, the fog of war. What is the fog of war? Well, it's sort of uncertainty in the game. Um, and as we see, we detected the enemy unit moving in to our region. And, but their other uh, units can have um, other types of uh, detection. So basically just because we control, we have contr at least control, we can detect enemy units. But their visibility can be other than detected. Uh, they can be unknown. They can be... Um, like, for example, if we move over to Eastern Europe, we can see here that we know that there are enemy land units there, but we don't really know what kind of unit it is. At least... At least not yet. Um, we see here also there is a Soviet unit. And um, units themselves have the ability to detect enemy units. So for example, the Army Command has something called Military Intelligence, which is a passive ability that it has. So, whenever not reorganizing, um, it detects land and air units in adjacent regions. So that that is why we we see that there is something there, but we don't we don't it doesn't identify it. It just detects that there is one there. Now, submarines are another unit um, that actually. Um, has an ability called Hunter Killer Duty, which is whenever it's not reorganizing, it detects and identifies sea units in adjacent non-Arctic regions. And we can see that's why we see all of these units, because actually we have a submarine that detects and identifies them. If we would take the submarine and return it to, the, to our command reserve, then we, s we no longer see his submarine, because now we don't have an any unit that can that is adjacent to it and can detect it, because this ability only applies to adjacent regions. So this one is adjacent to Iceland, and then of course we have um, control here. Okay, so... Let's try and use our army command and um, gain a little bit more control in order to found NATO. Now, I also want to point out that when you play your grand campaign, you might not have ended up with the same result as me. Because although the, the grand campaign is available for everyone, the Grand Campaign will not play out the same way twice. Um, so where you might be in your Grand Campaign might be different. The Marshall Plan might have ended up differently for you than it did for me. 
the AI might not play the same strategy against you as it plays against me. Um, but still, it should be enough for us to demonstrate what your early goals should be. And, of course, the early goals... Um, for example, one of those could be to establish the Northeast Passage, which means to gain control over Svalbard and mainland Norway. But because of the fact that we didn't really gain any influence here through the Marshall Plan, neither in Svalbard nor in mainland Norway, it's a little far-fetched for us to actually, it, it get kind of dangerous to move in units here. Um, so we'll try and uh, just secure France and Spain. So we move our army command over there. Um, okay, so we get to know about war zones now. Um, so war zones are, as mentioned, um, they are established, or they can happen, when you move into a hostile region, an enemy region that is either controlled or dominated, so that has 3, 4, or 5 influence. And when you do so, if it's controlled, then Doomsday incre is increased by 1. And if it's dominated by the opponent, so there's a 5, then the Doomsday will be maxed out. Now this can be important strategically, because, um, for example, you might want to launch a nuclear attack, then you do need to attack an enemy region, you might want to just max out Doomsday to be able to do so. Then you can attack an enemy dominated region. Or you might want to disarm to keep your opponent from maxing out domination. Uh, so, sorry, maxing out uh, the Doomsday Clock by attacking one of your regions where you have domination. Um... Ooh, that's an aggressive move. So, look at that. Surface fleet, the Soviet surface fleet moving into northern UK. Uh, that's a little bit dangerous. We don't want Iceland to our forces here. We might just remove this sur submarine fleet. We don't We don't want to get attacked by um, enemy surface fleet. As we see now, now we, it, it means for us, of course, now we lost tracking of, we don't, we don't really know where his unit is. Uh, oh. So let's uh, continue by securing France. Oh boy. So, Soviet invasion. Um, we see the Doomsday Clock went up with one, and we got attacked, so now there's a war zone here. Now this is a danger. And the reason it's a danger is because we only have... Um, one of our units now is reorganizing. And um, reorganizing units take nine turns to come back to becoming combat ready again. Um, and... Um, we saw his army command, the Soviet army command, actually attacked us in West Germany and attacked our fighter command in West Germany. Um, there is a way where you can use leaders to, uh, they have abilities to supply your units and so on, but we'll look at that in another video. Uh, important to know though is when your unit is reorganizing, they don't really defend. So if they get attacked, a second time, whilst we being reorganized, while whilst reorganizing, they will be lost. To either withdraw if you're attacked in a non-war zone, uh, or destroyed in a war zone. And and this is a war zone. So we see here, eight turns remain on our reorganizing uh, fighter command. So so that's that's tough. Um, now. Fighters, they're not really good at defending against army uh, commands. Um, they are really good at attacking 
other uh, units with air attacks, but they're not that great to defend against uh, army commands and especially not on the front line. Um, because when an, ar an army command attacks a um, fighter command, basically uh, our fighter command becomes reorganizing and there just becomes engaged. And engage is basically they have four, four turns, they are unavailable and they can attack again. So obviously um, we want to get this unit back into the command reserve. Uh, so it's it's not a target. Now well, what we could do is um, we could deploy unit um, and uh, when, when you have a unit deployed in the region and your opponent deploys something there our units will then ambush them. Um, so why does that work? Well it works because when you deploy a unit, it actually takes them one turn to become combat ready. So we could, for example, deploy a unit here in West Germany, but the problem with that is that it will only become combat ready after one turn. So we would actually have two units here that are not ready to wage combat. So that's why it's a bad idea for us to deploy a unit here. Now what we could do is, we could move our army command into West German Alpine Zone. Um, because then it can reinforce our fighter command. But the problem with doing that is, if we do that and we get attacked again, we don't know how many units he has here. And if we get, get attacked again and this unit becomes reorganized as well, then we will be losing two units. So that's... That's the danger of doing that. So instead, what we'll try to do is um, we'll try and put up a bomber command instead. Um, why that can be good is because if he then actually moves in units here, then we can bomb it. Um, so do we deploy that in Iceland or in Svalbard? Well, I would deploy it in... in uh, in, 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 in Iceland now. The reason is we don't know if this if there's still a surface fleet here, if there are units on that surface fleet. You can actually load um, army commands into surface fleets and invade. So we want we don't want to risk our bomber command getting destroyed there. So we're just gonna deploy it here in Iceland. As we see He did attack us there and destroyed our unit. Um, and when a unit gets destroyed, like our fighter command, it also rewards its cost in victory points to the one destroying it. So in this case, he gained four victory points. But that's all right, because now we have a bomber, and bombers can do bomber missions. So. We can, we can of course bomb his uh, surface fleet here, try to scare that off, or we can bomb his uh, army command, and that's exactly what we'll do. So when uh, doing a combat mission, or selecting combat order like we did now, we all we get into the combat simulator, and it looks like this. So here we see our uh, bomber command, it's combat ready at the moment. And we see the opponent's army command that's engaged for four, t four turns. And by doing this uh, combat order, confirming this combat order, we, our bomber command will become engaged and his unit will become reorganizing. And that's, that's great for us, so let's do that. Curtis LeMay, promote the interest alignment of our military. Deploy two fighter commands in West German Alpine Zone. Uh, we actually had two there, but... There we go. Okay. So we can reconnect the West Wing if we... If we have fighter commands in West German Alpine Zone. Um...
actually, we... Since we got France... Uh, we have two more turns left. So let's think about this now. What can we do with our remaining two turns? Well, we do want to destroy this unit. Um, and we can do that... Not with our Bomber Command, because it's engaged. And, as we said here, it's going to be engaged for four turns. Three more remaining. But, we can use our Army Command. Destroy this unit if we wanted to. Or, we can use our Fighter as on this Carrier Fleet. Because Carrier Fleets, they have uh, two main abilities. One called Air Superiority, which is that it, can ac it actually protects against air attacks in this region, enemy air attacks. And it has also Carrier Strike, which, is, which means that we can attack a uh, leader, land or air unit, any, anything but a submarine, basically, submarine fleet in region. So we will use our Carrier Strike ability and we will strike against this uh, army command. And the reason we're not using our our own army command is there might be more, so we don't want to put our army command in a war zone. And by, the, by using our fighters on this carrier, we don't actually need to put any unit there. So it will go from combat ready to engaged and his, units will, his unit will be lost and we gain 4 VP. So 4 victory points. Confirm that. And boom! There we go. Okay, so the current uh, Soviet focus has only one turn remaining. Be sure to review your options for upcoming focus selection. And it activates our focus, uh, current focus effect. Due to weak representation of the interests of the elites, the Department of State suggests strengthening their position. Okay, so current focus effects. Um, we didn't see that before because it wasn't enabled, but now we will be able to see the focus effects. And focus effects are when a focus has been selected, each focus provides you something during it whilst it lasts. So this first, very first focus, uh, where we had seven turns, there was no particular focus there, but now we will see a focus effect. So, here we see the focus effect. Um, and now that has been enabled. So, what does this focus actually do? Well, the Soviets gained two elites, and it increases their chance of reconnaissance, counterintelligence, and, boom and boomerang program by 15% during this focus. So basically, this gives us nothing. Now, you can click on this, the text, and it will get you to the focus selection screen. And as described here, the focus selection screen is where you can see what focus is available, you can for, for the entire timeline, and you can look at what they provide. So here they are. Um, this is what's available for the current, current timeline. And we are playing this particular focus, the politics of poverty. But this also shows us that there are um, these, blue, these blue ones are available for us. Um, so after this focus ends, we will be able to select a focus. Um, and a focus is, uh, it, so, so each focus has a certain amount of turns assigned to it. So this one had seven, if we would select later this one, it will have six, and so on. And after both uh, the Soviets and the US have selected one focus each, then we get into a new focus selection round because what will happen is that each other focus that we did not select will have the number of turns it provides reduced by three. And any focus that has less than three left after that reduction will no longer be available. So it means there are only a certain amount of focuses we can actually pick. So if we did not pick this focus in the focus selection round next, then it will only be available only one more round and then it's gone. Whilst this one 
will, if we don't pick it in the next focus selection, it will not be available at all. And what each, each focus also provides, beyond a bonus, um, an effect, is that they might enable policies for you to achieve beyond the policies you already have. So here we see, this was the last thing the Soviets did. They moved in another army command as suspected. That means that we can actually use our army command and attack it to make, to force it to reorganize. So let's make that happen. Well, actually, before we make that happen, let's just, let's just see what we should, we can select next. Because once we end this turn, then we will need to select the focus. So the Cliff Elsey report, it sets our leads to five. And whenever the Soviets fail an intelligence mission, we have a 50% chance to discover it. Uh, that's, that's very nice. And we don't have much leads. Look, we only have two. Um, let's see the Wirtschaftswunder. It sets influence in West German Alpine zone to match influence in East German Baltic zone. And we gain one finance. Hmm, so this one to match this one. Well, they already do, so maybe that doesn't provide us much. Um, enemies within. Gain one elite's alignment. Oh, that would be nice. We don't have any. And set government alignment to zero. Well, it's already zero, so we have nothing to lose with selecting uh, in selecting this one. Strategic Air Command, gain two military, add one arsenal for each research nuclear technology. That's interesting. Um, though we do have a little bit of military already. So, from that perspective, the Cliff Elsie report is much more interesting. Let's see the British Lion. Set influence in French Belgian zone to two, gain one military alignment. This one we don't want to pick. Well, the military alignment is good because we don't have any, but look, we already have four influence here, so that actually means we're gonna, it, it's gonna be a setback because we fo focus on the British and the French don't really like that, it seems. Um, so yeah, probably good for us to select the Cliff Elsa report. Um, Let's also see what policies that it enables. So you can just uh, see here, influence at least 12 in Eastern Europe. And do we have that? Uh, I don't know. We don't. We have five and five, that's 10. Nothing more. So that's not a policy we can quickly accomplish. But what does it do? Well, just click on it once. Gain influence in all regions without Soviet control. Now there, there basically aren't any. Yeah, no, there aren't any. Uh, so what does this other one do? The Venona project. Increase success chance of counterintelligence by 5%. Gain 8 VP. That's really good. That's really good. So, yeah. And there will, there will be a great one for us to pick. Okay, so let's do our uh, final turn by attacking this army command. So we both will go from combat ready to reorganizing. Okay, so we enable the minimap and uh, and the delay button. So what's the delay button? Well, there. If we don't want to select any focus, then we can actually choose to delay. And if both factions, both us and the Soviets choose to delay, or we click the delay button at one after another, then the timeline immediately ends without any further focuses being played. Uh, what this also does is it enables us to spend two people to gain two elites. Um, and as, as mentioned, all friendly focuses get their turn amount reduced by three when that happens. When, if, if we delay, because then we give up our turn to select the focus. Um, 
So it can be a good strategic way of converting people into elites. Uh, but we're not going to do that now. We are going to actually select the Cliff Elsie report. Now we could select one of the opponent's focuses as well. And um, I often get asked, well, what's the benefit of doing that? Uh, there, there can definitely be benefits in doing so. Uh, for example, one of the benefits could be if you have forces that are um, reorganizing, That are reorganizing like here the soviets if we would select a western european uh, focus um, then it means that they can actually uh, choose to disarm here in this theater and that means removing this unit so then it means when it when it becomes our turn after the focus election we can't actually destroy it so there, there can be benefits in, in doing so. Also, if in case none of your uh, focuses give any bonuses that you desire, then it might be valuable for you to select one of the opponents. Uh, but the, the issue here is you don't know what effects that actually gives and the effect will still trigger. Um, another reason why you might want to select something is to gain a certain amount of turns that you might want to be playing. So for example, this would give only five turns, but this one seven, and you might have something where you need more turns. So it's a strategical uh, balance here of what you select. But for us, definitely the um, Cliff of the RC report here is, is, a, is a good good one because it gains us three extra elites. So let's make that happen. Okay, so what happens when you select a focus? Well, directly after selecting focus, you need to select what sort of posture you're going to put your armed forces in, or your nation in general. Are you going to arm or disarm? Um, and you need to select either one of those. You can't select both. If you arm, that means you can declare war zones and your military is you know on high alert ready to attack so you can move into enemy regions do all of that stuff at attack uh, full full force with disarm though it means you garrison all friendly forces in the theater where the focus is, so in this case the Cliff Elsie report is in Eastern Europe. So all of our units here would go back into our command reserve. Luckily we don't have any units here so it doesn't really matter for us. But for example in Western Europe it would mean all of these units, the bomber, the army command, the carrier, they would be returned to our command reserve. And uh, for being so magnanimous and disarming, we would also we also gain um, a, um, a an influence bonus. But this only happens if you're the only one disarming. So if your opponent also disarms, you get mutual disarmament, then you don't get that influence bonus. So obviously in Eastern Europe, we're gonna choose disarm, you know, because none of our units get removed from the map and also we gain three influence to place so possibly so let's make that happen disarmament okay now the top theater info is enabled hey look we disarmed they did not so we gain uh, three influence to place and we have about a minute to place it uh, there are several ways that can be strategically important. One thing if you want to do inf intel missions is to place it in the, the opponent's capital, which we'll do. We'll place three of them there. And we'll get to why that is important. Uh, but it all, we also see we can do the Venona project. And of course we want to have 
increased counterintelligence chance, so we're gonna do that. There we go. Excellent. Welcome back. So uh, here in the encyclopedia, if we want to enable or check out what the intelligence does, we can go to intelligence. And um, and and we can check out uh, the, the different miss missions. So like espionage. Yeah, basically it allows us to spend elites to uncover Soviet domestic interests. So we can sort of see, and as we as you see here, the mission is done in the enemy capital. So that's why it can be good for us to um, reduce influence in the enemy capital. Now, asking Mervyn in the encyclopedia about things also automatically unlocks them. So now we have intelligence unlocked. Welcome back. So for example, um, if we choose something else, you can get ahead in the grand campaign by selecting them. Um, but I'm not going to be enabling a bunch of other stuff. Um, we'll, we'll go back to uh, what's happening in um, Western Europe because we have our bomber command and we have a reorganizing enemy army command we want to bomb. Now, doing actions in non-focused theaters because the focus is uh, in Eastern Europe will carry an extra cost in people because we told our nation the, that we would be focusing on Eastern Europe but we are actually back in Western Europe doing stuff but this is a cost that we definitely can't take and besides it will destroy the enemy unit so worth it for sure so let's make that happen let's bomb it and we see we'll go from combat ready to engaged again and his unit will be lost so let's make that happen there we go and we gained the victory points for that hey lightning lord um Yeah, sure. Maybe we can take up the game uh, l later, for sure, for sure. Another thing we might want to consider is uh, arming here the Lucian Islands. So, the Lucian Islands is... Uh, well, it's an American island um, that we dominate in Eastern Europe. We also have West Berlin, which is stuck in the middle of um, enemy territory here in East German Baltic Zone. We can't deploy any units there because we don't have access to it currently. Uh, not for large-scale deployment. Um, now, beyond navigating by clicking the, um, the snippets here on the map, we can also use the global minimap to navigate. So if you click the global minimap and uh, you have the main overview mode selected, if you select any or click any of the theaters and you see the theaters here, North America, Central America, South America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, East Asia, South Asia, Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Middle East. You can click any of those and it will take you there immediately. So for example, if you wanted to go to the Middle East, you can just simply click that and it will take us there. Another thing that we have here is the logistics view. And logistics is uh, how we deploy units. And uh, logistics always flows from our capital. So um, this can be another reason why you might want to decrease the influence in your opponent's capital. And once you have logistics view selected, 
you can see, you can click any region to see the logistics route it will take us to get there. Or if it's an enemy region, you can see what it will take for the enemy to get there. So we can see here, for example, from his capital, land units will go this way, will cost him zero finance to deploy in, uh, in this region. But sea units will actually cost one finance. For us to deploy in the Lucian Islands, if logistics will flow from our eastern, uh, eastern United States region here via Canada for land units, Alaska, and then the Lucian Islands. Or for sea units, we will have to go to the east coast, then follow uh, the coast into the Lucian Islands. And both of those will cost us one. Now there is a third one, which is the nuclear authorization one, where we can basically get a preview of uh, how a nuclear war would play out if, um, if there was one. We can't launch one, obviously, as mentioned. Doomsday needs to be maxed. But we can see here we would bomb two Soviet regions, and we suspect that they would bomb three of ours. Obviously, they aim for Alaska, <laughs> Western and Eastern United States. Um, so why the logistics is important is because we, we might want to deploy something here in the Lucian Islands and fortify the Lucian Islands. So uh, another reason is that we can uh, decrease the logistics cost by deploying surface fleets. Because surface fleets have a specific ability to um, convoy units. Um, and convoying reduces cost from one region to another for logistics throughput. So if we would deploy surface fleets uh, along that logistics line, then we could decrease their cost for deployment. Um, and when we look, we have surface fleets available. So, for example, we could deploy one in, in Alaska here if we wanted to. Uh, so let's make that happen. So we can deploy a unit there. Oh. oh, God. The Soviets just invaded West Berlin. There we go. Well, we uh, in this game, to uh, emphasize, just because you invade a region, now there's a war zone there, and Doomsday has been maxed, it doesn't actually mean that you gain control of it. As, as mentioned, you need to secure it. So this simulates the fact that just because you have military presence somewhere, it doesn't mean that you have gained control of that. Um, just like... The U.S. didn't get, ha, gain control over Afghanistan or by having forces, or the Soviets didn't gain control of Afghanistan when they were there, or the U.S. didn't have control in Indochina and Vietnam and during the Vietnam War and so on. So you must secure that. Um, okay, but we have deployed a surface fleet, and we see that that reduced our logistics cost. So now we can actually deploy here without having to pay finance. So let's do that. Let's deploy a fighter command here to the Lucian Islands. Okay. We see a great pillar of Asian communism happened. So let's go to South Asia. And what we see here is a leader, Ho Chi Minh. The Soviets start with Ho Chi Minh, already in Indochina, talking about Indochina and Vietnam. And uh, he has an ability that he used, the Great Pillar of Asian Communism, to place one influence in, uh, in South Asia. And he did so uh, in a region with a strait. And straits, they are uh, regions that can uh, section off a theater or the map in general and 
can choke off logistics. So it's important that you control straights. And you see there's a straight right here uh, in the time lesion zone. And um, if he would gain control over this region where we have presence still, then this little thing will this little button will be filled in and we wouldn't be able to pass logistics through there. Just like uh, we have control over Northern Japan blocking this particular strait. Um, Alright, we're not very concerned about that. Um, what we're gonna be doing instead is um, We're going to go to our home theater and we're going to be fetching a bomber command. Um, now, selecting Eastern United States, we see we have an army command there, two fighter commands, two bomber commands, and one carrier uh, fleet. Um, and actually, we will rebase our bomb, uh, one of the bomber commands. So we just select to return that to the command reserve. Yes. Then we go to Western Europe. And from our reserve, we can then deploy a bomber command to the Aleutian Islands. So we're gonna do that. There we go. Um, so our uh, influence in time Malaysian zone has been removed. Uh, we no longer have presence there. That means we can't deploy there if we, if, even if we wanted to. But that's all right, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna. Now that we have some forces here in the Lucian Islands, we're gonna throw this guy out, and um, we will do so by using. Um, we could use a carrier fleet. Carrier fleets are. Um, really good against surface fleets, so whenever the defender is a surface fleet, it's immediately defeated if we attack. The problem with carrier fleets is it's dangerous, it can be dangerous if we move in here. Uh, the carrier fleets are very vulnerable to submarine fleets. Um, so, so it can be dangerous for us to move in there. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to move in first with our surface fleet. So surface fleet against surface fleet, both will be reorganizing. Let's make that happen. And then we can move in with our submarine fleet here instead. And since the surface fleet is reorganizing, a second attack against it, even though the, the submarine fleet otherwise would be vulnerable against surface fleets, will mean it will we force it to withdraw. And it gives us three victory points, which is um, when you force a unit to withdraw, you gain half its value in victory points. So in this case, three, since uh, surface fleet is worth six victory points. So let's confirm that. Oh, very interesting. Chi Minh has defeated his power. But let's just go back here and check out what happened. So we moved in our our uh, submarine fleet here and we see that in fact there is a an enemy surface fleet hiding away in far eastern Russia or parked there with an army command loaded onto it. Um, another interesting element is that, of course, um, the um, the timeline ended. So, uh, sorry, the focus ended. So there's a new focus selection, and the Soviets have selected uh, Western Europe as the next focus, and they gain influence in Western Euro gain one influence in Western Europe, and they set the people influence to six. So they just gained a bunch of people influence. Okay. Um, now, we could disarm, remove all our forces, 
and gain two influence here to place. As we see, because both the opponent and us have done one focus selection already, uh, all of the other focuses have had, yeah, been reduced by three, and the ones that didn't have any, at least three remaining, are no longer on the list here. Um, so, British Lion and Wirtschaftswunder that had seven, still, both of these are still here. Um, okay, so we could disarm, which removes all of our units here from the map, but I don't think that would be advantageous for us to do. Um, so we're gonna select arm, because these units are already deployed and we can use them to leverage them against the enemy units here. So let's let's make that happen. Arms race. So we do arms race, but they also selected arms race, and they also um, completed the policy. Fifth international. Okay. Um, we have gained leader in the Middle East, David Ben Gurion. Uh, we won't go through and recruit him this time. Instead, um, what we'll do is um, we'll try to get the funding of NATO done. But try to secure a little bit more. So let's put an army command into uh, Svalbard. So we deploy that. Oh! Have the enemy moving in again into Western Europe. We're gonna bomb that one. Set it to reorganize. Then we're gonna use our unit in uh, Svalbard. Up. A second unit moving in. Now. It would have been better for us actually to do a carrier strike first because if we had done a carrier strike then we could have used the bomber to bomb both of these because uh, carriers attack one unit at a time but if we select the combat ready bomber like this one then you, we can see that what bomber missions do is that they engage any one leader and all land, air and sea units in the region. So, it would have been better for us to actually attack with a carrier strike on that single unit so that we could have used the bomber command attacking both of these units uh, this turn instead. Okay, but let's fund NATO. Let's make that happen. We only have one turn left, so we want to do it now. And what we see is that all of our controlled regions are now dominated, so we get five everywhere where we had control. So that's really good. That's why we wanted to deploy this unit on small bot. And now we see that there's an enemy unit there as well. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a carrier strike against that unit. And we see here that um, our combat ready a carrier strike will be against an enemy, uh, the available enemy unit. That. There we go. And then we get to do the next focus selection. So if we wanted to now, we could uh, select the British Lion, but obviously we don't want to give up the French Belgian zone and reduce that to two influence. So, uh, this is our best choice. Um, but uh, as we see here, it sets our influence to whatever the East German Baltic zone is. And if we look here, that's only three. So in essence, we will reduce the West German Alpine zone by two influence by selecting this one. So, what are we left with? Well. None of these, these then are really that good for us. So we could choose to delay 
which means we can uh, turn more people into elites and um, that would be a great that that would be better than either of these two because we would lose influence by selecting those so not necessarily a benefit for us we could select one of his but this one's in Eastern Europe we don't really have that much to do there well we could potentially do some attacks but we don't know what benefits this provides him and the other one is in Western Europe and we don't really want to risk it we don't know what it, that is so we will choose to delay and by delaying he also chose to delay which means the timeline has ended and we have begun a brand new timeline Um, and with that, I think I'll end the video here, and then we'll go into what what happens. But I want to put emphasis on the fact that when this timeline ended, we gained our alignment, as mentioned. We gained one finance and one people, as our alignment says we should. Um, and uh, it, it means we then ready to get going. Uh, what we also can see is this exclamation mark for our elites because we actually maxed up our elites and what that means for us we'll get into um, we'll get into uh, next time uh, so I thank you all for watching and I hope this gets you through your very first timeline in um, terminal conflict if you, should you have any questions, thoughts, or anything, please join us on Discord. Just write us there. Uh, the, we, the, from the dev team, we fre frequently have answer questions there. You can also write us on the forums. Just uh, go to the Steam forums and write anything there. And I hope uh, this gives you some uh, insights in how uh, you can uh, progress and uh, build up, uh, first of all, your uh, your military forces so you have some military forces to contain the soviet onslaught when it comes if it comes uh, and second um, what you need to do in order to uh, make your fo first focus selection um, go through and enable your policies that you might have available to gain victory points and in general uh, orient you in how you can move around the, the map and uh, select different types of units and what uh, sort of a baseline strategy can be f to make use of those units. There is a lot more in depth and you will see that as we go through this you will find combinations of how units can be used together and how they can be leveraged but also um, how you can win the entire game without using any military units at all just going for disarmament and going for example rushing towards the space race or you might want to focus on a more peaceful uh, building a more peaceful society in general and um, with that I thank you all and uh, hey thanks Cleveland um, and uh, should there be uh, any questions or thoughts uh, make sure to write us. Take care for now then. See you!